All right, good afternoon. My name is Tracy Paff Smith, and I am the Executive Director of the Huntington Historical Society, joining you here from Huntington. We're so glad to have you join us. Just a few quick housekeeping things before we get started. We have everyone muted and your camera off. Please leave it that way just for a good experience for everyone. Um, that chat box we were using to introduce ourselves, or if you haven't located it yet, please do. We'll use that for questions and you can put your questions in there as we go along. And at the end, uh, Lauren and Darren will address them for us. And please be specific if you're talking about a specific photo or slide, because by the time we get to the end, we won't remember what it was you were referring to. Um, all right, so let's get started. Why is my thing not advancing here? Here we go. I want to say a very special thank you to our sponsor, People's United Bank. They were sponsoring our in-person Lunch and Learns, and now that we've moved the show virtually, uh, they've been wonderful to, to keep sponsoring us. So thank you, People's United Bank. Also, thank you to anyone who made a donation when you registered, or those who renewed their membership. We so, so appreciate your support, and thank you, thank you, thank you. Very quickly, some of our coming events. Um, this Sunday, two of our properties are gonna be open for tours. Our Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Building and our Conklin Farmhouse will be open one to four. More details about that on our website. We have monthly tours of the Old Burying Ground, which is that beautiful cemetery right behind the Soldiers and Sailors Building as you're headed in or out of the village. Um, those are happening once a month from now until November. Our next virtual lunch and learn is gonna be May 27th, and that will be with Robert Hughes, our town historian. He's going to be discussing uh, current topics in local preservation. So the Peter Crippen house, um, Mary and Carl farmhouse, you know, different topics that, uh, that are, um, he'll be informing us about these topics and, and the progress of them. So that should be a really great Lunch and Learn. Hope to see you then. And we're very excited to announce that we're bringing back our garden tour, which is gonna be Sunday, June 6. It's all outdoors. It's a self-guided tour of six private gardens and you drive from garden to garden. And those tickets are gonna go on sale in about a week or so. So check our website. I'll send all this information when I send out the email after this event. All right, so enough of me talking. I'm gonna stop sharing here and turn it over to our guests. So we're so pleased to have with us today, Lauren Brincat, who is the curator of Preservation Long Island and Darren St. George, who is the education coordinator. Director. Uh, direct, excuse me, <laughs> education director. I'm trying to demote you. Uh, <laughs> Preservation Long Island. And they're gonna tell us about Jupiter Hammond. I'm gonna put their bio information in the chat for anyone who's interested, and I will turn it over to you. All right, great. Thank you so much. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Before we begin, we have a poll question for all of you that we'd like to kick things off with. Are you familiar with Jupiter Hammond? Yes, I've read his work before. No, but I'm looking forward to learning more. We'd just like to get a feel for where, where are we starting today? And well, it looks like 50-50. This is pretty strong. Wow, this is fantastic. I'm so happy to see this. Wow, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have um, expected it to be so evenly divided. That's wonderful. All right, so for everybody who is familiar with Jupiter Hammond, that's great. For everybody who's looking to learn more, you've come to the right place. <laughs> Let's get started. Let me tell you a little bit about Preservation Long Island. It was originally founded in 1948 as the Society for the Preservation of Long Island Antiquities. Now, Preservation Long Island is a non-for-profit organization committed to working with Long Islanders to protect preserve and celebrate our shared heritage through advocacy, education, and the stewardship of historic sites and collections. Now, Preservation Long Island owns and interprets four historic properties across Long Island. The Joseph Lloyd Manor on Lloyd Neck, which is the house we'll be focusing most primarily today, the Sherry Jane Farm in Setauket, and the Custom House in Sag Harbor. Our headquarters is a fourth historic building. It's the Old Methodist Church in Cold Spring Harbor, and it also serves as our gallery and uh, space for exhibitions and events. 
Today we're going to focus on Joseph Lloyd Manor. We'll be exploring its history of enslavement, the story of Jupiter Hammond, the first published African-American poet, and Preservation Long Island's work to reinterpret the house through the ongoing Jupiter Hammond project, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. Many Americans today are calling for more meaningful dialogue about the history and legacy of slavery in our country. Likewise, as the success of popular arts and media like Hamilton and the 1619 Project demonstrates, Americans, we are eager for more relevant and equitable, equitable interpretations of our shared past. Now, the Jupiter Hammond Project, this is its mission statement, and it's how we began our journey to learn more about Jupiter Hammond and the many men and women who were enslaved at the Joseph Lloyd House. We do want to take a moment and thank our sponsors and partners, as well as the Jupiter Hammond Project Advisory Council. We'll talk more about them later, but thank you for all of your support. Here we have a brief video to help contextualize the location and the history of the Joseph Lloyd Manor. So let's take a look. Wonderful. Lauren, can you tell us, please, a little bit more about the house? And by a little, I mean a lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks, Darren. Before we get started and dive into the history, um, Tracy, I want to thank you and the Huntington Historical Society for inviting us to speak today. Um, it's always a joy uh, to talk with all of you, especially for me as a Huntington native, to talk about the history of the place where I grew up. And before we dive in, we have one more poll question. We are just curious. How many of you have visited Joseph Lloyd Manor before? If you haven't, that's completely fine. We hope that you visit us at some point this year. We hope to open the house. Um, keep an eye on our Instagram, Facebook, and webpage. Um, and if you have, thank you. Um, but please come back and visit us. So we have, again, another 50-50 yeah. split. So mm -hmm. that's great. I hope <laughs> that you all um, come visit us soon in the near future. Lauren, we're missing a poll question. We should have been able to ask now, of the people who are familiar with Joseph, with Jupiter Hammond, are those the same people who visited ah, Joseph Lloyd Manor? Good question. Yeah. <laughs> you can let us know in the chat. Let us know in the <laughs> chat if you're the same person. You saw both. <laughs> Um, so on the surface, Joseph Lloyd Manor is a beautiful mid 18th century Georgian mansion with stunning views of Lloyd Harbor as shown in that wonderful drone video. For a long time, the interpretation of the house has focused primarily on the elite lifestyles of the Lloyd family, the architecture of the house and the decorative arts contained within. In a way, um, we talk about all the things that are beautiful in the present but ignored all the ugliness of the past. And this is something I am paraphrasing from a Monticello historian, Nia Bates, talking about the interpretation of that wonderful um, you know, house in Virginia where Thomas Jefferson lived. Um, the history of Joseph Lloyd Manor, but like that of the United States, is one that's rooted in settler colonialism and enslavement. And Jupiter Hammond was just one of more than 40 people the Lloyd family enslaved for over a century. These names represent mothers and fathers, children, grandparents and grandchildren, nieces, nephews and uncles, people like Aurelia, a talented spinner who the Lloyds made money off of by selling her skills to others for eight pounds a year, or Michael Cox, a gifted musician who seized his own freedom and ran away from Joseph Lloyd Manor with his violin and sheet music. There are so many stories to tell and still so much to uncover. And we are learning more and more every day about all the people who lived, labored, and survived in around Joseph Lloyd Manor. 
And I want to take this moment to gratefully acknowledge that Joseph Lloyd Manor and the entire town of Huntington is located on indigenous land, the ancestral homeland of the Matinecock Indian Nation, whose descendants continue to nourish deep relationships with this land and its waters and fight for a future that acknowledges the past and uplifts the present. Comset is the Matinecock place name for the landmass known today as Lloyd Neck. It was first documented in this 1654 land agreement between Radiocon Sagamore and three English colonizers. During the 17th century, the Neck was an abundant region of forest meadows and waters that sustained Matinecock communities who had stewarded this land for thousands of years. And this really fascinating document is in the Sylvester Manor archive um, at NYU. Following English colonization, the Matinecock did not disappear from the neck. In fact, a series of wigwams are present in this 1687 survey demonstrating that a significant Matinecock population remained in the area and interacted with both European colonizers and enslaved Africans. Around the time this survey was done, James Lloyd, a wealthy Boston merchant, claimed ownership of the neck through his marriage to Grisel Sylvester of Shelter Island. In 1685, he became the first Lord through royal patent of the Manor of Queen's Village, a 3,000 acre plantation that encompassed the entirety of what was also known as Horse Neck. James and Grizel never moved to Queen's Village themselves, but remained in Boston and leased out parcels of land to tenant farmers. Large manorial estates like Queen's Village were a distinctive feature of land holding in colonial New York. During the late 17th century, colonial governors made at least 14 land grants with manorial privileges, meaning they were independent administrative units with authority vested in lords. And of course, another one of those manors was Sylvester Manor on Shelter Island. And a shout out to Donna Marie, um, who's in the program today, who's the curator and archivist over there. And it was the family home of James Lloyd's wife, Frizzell. It is here at Sylvester Manor that the entangled stories of Jupiter Hammond's family and the Lloyd family begins here on Long Island. Sometime in the late 1600s, Jupiter's paternal grandparents, Tamaro and Oyo, arrived on the foreign shores of Shelter Island. They had survived capture from their West African homelands, the treacherous Atlantic crossing, and enslavement on the Sylvester family's Barbadian sugar plantation. Sylvester Manor, like Queens Village, was a provisioning plantation, which played a critical role in the global economy by supplying massive enslaved workforces in the Caribbean with foodstuffs and other goods. And I have to just show this object. Um, on Shelter Island, Tamara and Oyo were forced to adapt to a new environment and they became part of a community of enslaved and indentured Africans and Manhansett peoples who despite the brutality of enslavement held on to their cultural identities, shared traditional practices and created families. Archaeologists excavate this incredible ceramic vessel from the plantation core at Sylvester Manor, which blends indigenous design and materials with European style and West African firing techniques. This one object embodies the diverse cultural forces that were active and present on Long Island at places like Sylvester Manor and Queens Village during this period. While enslaved at Sylvester Manor, Tamara and Oyo had at least four children. One of them was Obium, the father of Jupiter Hammond. But the union between the Lloyd and Sylvester families would ultimately tear Tamro and Oyo's family apart. James Lloyd purchased Obium in 1687 and removed him to Boston, where he remained for almost 25 years. He did run away at one point, um, and we speculate that maybe he tried to go back home to um, 
Shelter Island. Um, so he was there in Boston for many years until once again, his world was turned upside down. In March of 1711, James and Grizel's son, Henry, began construction on the first manor house at Queens Village on Lloyd Neck. That same month, Henry noted in his accounts the purchase of four enslaved people, Bridget, Nero, Jack, and Obium. Their forced labor helped build this house and run the plantation. And this is Henry Lloyd Manor House located today inside Combsett State Park and stewarded by the Lloyd Harbor Historical Society. On October 7th of that same year in 1711, Henry Lloyd also noted in his ledger the birth of Jupiter, the son of Obium and Rose, the grandson of Tamro and Oyo, and a baby boy he considered his property. The births and premature deaths of at least nine other children born to enslaved parents are listed too. Kit, Samuel, Eliakim, Anna, Sarah, Patricia, Elkanah, Priscilla, and Chloe, as well as, well as one old Narragansett man. These individuals form the basis of a vibrant Black community that grew up around Lloyd Harbor and Huntington during the 18th and 19th centuries and which is still present today. While enslaved at the Henry Lloyd Manor House, Hammond authored his earliest known published work, An Evening Thought, composed on Christmas Day in 1760 and printed as a broadside the following year. In total, three essays and six poems by Hammond survive and are known to us today, making him one of only two North American authors to publish while enslaved during the 18th century and a founder of African American literature. The other author to publish in North America during this time while enslaved was Bostonian Phyllis Wheatley Peters, who Hammond addressed in poetic verse while in exile in Connecticut during the Revolutionary War. It is unknown if Phyllis ever responded to Hammond, but the two authors were closely connected through Hammond's enslavers. With his address, which is shown on the left, um, which is difficult to read, Jupiter celebrates their shared African heritage and adoption of Christianity. More than four decades Wheatley Sr., Hammond also acts as a mentor and gently argues against her preoccupation for worldly manners, matters over spiritual salvation. Um, and if you are interested in learning more, this is a plug for our blog. Um, there is a post on our website that Darren just dropped into the chat um, that explores Jupiter Hammond and Phyllis Wheatley and their writings um, during the American Revolution. So Hammond's deep Christian faith is reflected throughout his writings. At the age of 21, he purchased a Bible from Henry Lloyd. And we also know from a late 19th century newspaper, a snippet um, you can see here, that Jupiter inherited from his father a book of Psalms, and along with it, likely a devotion to reading and the oral recitation of religious verse. The image on the left, sadly, is not Hammond's actual book of Psalms, um, which is unfortunately nowhere to be found, um, but an exact copy of the one that is described in this article. Words, whether written, spoken, or sung, have played and continue to play a central role in West African history, politics, and religion. In our exploration of Hammond's life through the ongoing Jupiter Hammond project, there has been discussion about Hammond being a griot, which is a West African oral historian, musician, poet, and storyteller, a tradition that Hammond would have inherited from his father and his grandparents. In America, people of African descent retained their cultural heritage by incorporating African religious traditions into Christianity. And we believe that Hammond was a preacher and delivered sermons to local communities. In 1769, Mary Cooper of Oyster Bay noted in her diary that she went to a meeting to hear a black man preach. It is quite possible that man was Jupiter Hammond. The gradual development of African American Christianity would ultimately undermine slavery by encouraging communal ties among African descended people. 
Hammond's deep Christian faith was also further encouraged by his enslavers. Henry Lloyd's second wife, Mary Clark, was also deeply religious. In 1750, her devotional writings were posthumously published by Ebenezer, Ebenezer Pemberton Jr., her son by her first marriage. In the book, Pemberton describes his mother's insistence that domestic servants who were enslaved observe the Sabbath a time she used to instruct and educate those around her on religious subjects. Mary Lloyd was present in Jupiter Hammond's life throughout his young adulthood and likely played an instrumental role in his education and religious upbringing. And um, another um, shout out to our blog, we have a post um, that Darren can also drop into the chat that explores this work. Um, it's actually, this book here is a recent acquisition um, that we've acquired at Preservation Long Island and explores Mary Lloyd and Phyllis Wheatley and their influence on Jupiter Hammond. When Henry Lloyd died in 1763, the manor of Queens Village was divided among his four surviving sons and enslaved families were likely dismantled as individuals were bequeathed to children living in Boston, Connecticut, and Long Island. Joseph Lloyd inherited Jupiter, who remained at Queens Village, and in 1767 built this house, a grand statement of his wealth and social standing. While enslaved at Joseph Lloyd Manor, Hammond authored his two most significant works, both in 1786 an address to the Negroes in the state of New York, and an essay on slavery. Hammond was 75 years old when he wrote an address to the Negroes in the state of New York, and by then was a well-established elder in the Black community. He presented this address to the African Society, an influential Black activist group in New York City, a type of secret society based in West African tradition. Hammond's address is a complex piece of prose written during a time of great uncertainty, especially for the Black population. The U.S. had recently gained the independence it fought a war over, but had not yet ratified the Constitution, and calls for the abolition of slavery were growing locally. This work has often been characterized as being too accommodating to enslavement and the status quo, but I, I think Hammond was a real master of his language and position in society. And in his address advocates for the moral improvement of black New Yorkers through religion and education. In reality, an acceptable philosophy to the white enslavers who ultimately published his works and a strategy that was eventually embraced by the African society in the hopes of convincing white officials that Black New, Yorker, New Yorkers were equal and worthy citizens. Hammond was also acutely aware of what emancipation would look like for the elderly formerly enslaved in a society where no laws existed that could protect them from poverty and homelessness. Hammond wished for freedom for the young and able, but admits in this address that freedom wasn't for him. Again, he was 75 years old and after a lifetime of enslavement would have had little means of supporting himself. During this time, low wages and scarce work made it difficult for freed men and women, regardless of age and ability, to hold on to land or wealth. Uh, to quote Dr. Jennifer Anderson, one of our project scholars, freedom isn't power. And the consequences of these historical disparities continue to impact American society today. Despite Hammond's reservations about his own freedom, we believe that he was emancipated near the end of his life and lived with his brother's grandchildren in this house which stands today on West Shore Road near Mill Dam Park in a much altered state until his death sometime before 1806. Jupiter was in his 90s. Um, and just one more uh, plug for our blog. We've got another article on our website that explores the complexities of gradual emancipation and its impact on Hammond's family called Jupiter Hammond and New York's long struggle for freedom. 
So I'll end talking about this last work. Um, the same year that Hammond penned the address, he authored an essay on slavery, which is his most overt denouncement of American chattel slavery, a sin he proclaims created by man. It is also the only known working draft of Hammond's poetry written in his own elegant hand. It's quite beautiful. The piece was never published and it's interesting to consider why. Perhaps it was too radical for John Lloyd who enslaved Hammond at the time to allow the poem to be printed. Lloyd's name after all is written there right at the top alongside Hammond's. Despite the systems that attempted to hold him back, Hammond found agency in his writing, using the language of Christianity to resist oppression and to speak directly to Black Americans, even the face of a system that depended on depriving them of any sense of community and connection. As his words demonstrate, Hammond was an intellectual commentator on the world around him writing about the social and moral conflicts of slavery and freedom during the founding of the United States, writing at the same time on the very same topics as the likes of Benjamin Franklin, Alexander Hamilton, and Thomas Jefferson. And he was born and lived right here in Huntington. The words of Jupiter Hammond were a key point of exploration during the Hu Jupiter Hammond project and are also insights into us understanding him today. Here we have an excerpt of poet Malik Works impromptu recitation of Jupiter Hammond's An Essay on Slavery. Our forefathers came from Africa, tossed over the raging main to a Christian shore, therefore to stay and not return again. Dark and dismal was the day when slavery began. All humble thoughts were put away, then slaves were made by man. When God doth please for to permit that slavery should be, it is our duty to submit till Christ shall make us free. There's something quite powerful about hearing the word so often read when exploring his poetry, but hearing it recited really, uh, it really means a lot. We have one last poll question for all of you. We're gonna talk a bit about the Jupiter Hammond Project and we'd like to know if you participated. Did you attend any of the Jupiter Hammond Project roundtables? Um, yes, I watched everything. I followed it a little bit or nope, I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> oh, wow, this is fantastic. Yeah. All right, um, so that's good. A lot of 30% say that they've seen everything. Um, for 11% uh, say that they followed it a little bit and 61% nope I haven't seen it yet so we'll talk about it right now and explain a little bit about what's going on what we're working on so to understand Jupiter Hammond's story is to really understand American history in 2019 Preservation of Long Island launched the Jupiter Hammond project and I'll speak more about its structure in a little bit in a little bit regarding how under-recognized Hammond is, as well as the deficiency in our own telling of his story. The project is an ongoing, long-term initiative to transform how we engage visitors at the Joseph Lloyd Manor. We want the interpretation of Jupiter Hammond's story, the site's history of enslavement, and the legacy of slavery on Long Island to be relevant and equitable. In doing this work, our aim is to decentralize the institutional perspective in favor of an interpretation that is guided by the needs and wants of our community, and hopefully the descendants as well. We quickly learned that language is very important. These are the words we, cho we choose to use specifically to decenter the perspective of a white dominant culture. This is not a complete list by any means, but these are the terms that, we, that continue to present themselves as important terms to discuss. When the project began, we strongly were influenced by the in engaged descendant communities rubric created in 2019 by James Madison's Montpelier and the National Trust for Historic Preservation. The very first thing we did when we began the project was to establish a community advisory council to work with us to shape every aspect of the project as we moved forward. They continue to advise us today. Members, included, members include individuals involved in the Town of Huntington African American Historic Designation Council and colleagues from other organizations already doing exemplary work in this area. 
The photo that you can see here is a number of, number of us at our very first meeting inside the Joseph Lloyd Manor in March of 2019, which seems like eons ago. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure uh, many of you are probably familiar with a few of the individuals. Melissa is there, Irene, who you can see in the picture, as well as the niece from the Oyster Bay Historical Society. On the right next to me are Zenzele and Julia, and they come from Weeksville Heritage Center in Brooklyn. As a group, we walked through the house and we had an honest conversation about its interpretation and its history and began to create an action plan. We are truly grateful for every single member of the Advisory Council for their feedback, time, and support. In August of 2019, we brought in the International Coalition for the Sites of Conscience to conduct a service program they called Arc of Dialogue Training. We invited the Jupiter Hammond Project Advisory Committee, Preservation Long Island staff, as well as Preservation Long Island board members to attend. And the Arc of Dialogue I highly recommend for any organization or individual that's lucky enough to participate. It's a mode of communication which invites people with varied experiences and differing perspectives to engage in an open-ended conversation toward the express goal of personal and collective learning. We used a combination of questions, techniques, activities, and ground rules to ensure that all participants can communicate with integrity. These were the principles and values we wanted to instill from the beginning of the Jupiter Hammond project. Now this here is a screenshot from a resources page we created on Preservation Long Island's website. This page was born out of our personal need to assemble a centralized location for all the research we were doing and collecting in preparation for the roundtables. Now this page is still up and is divided into three categories. I just dropped the link into the chat if you're interested in learning more. But the three categories are historical documents such as primary sources, we have digital resources such as interactive websites like Columbia University's Mapping the African American Past, and scholarly publications such as relevant articles and blog posts. All of these resources, as well as the recordings from the Jupiter Hammond Project can be found on Preservation Long Island's website. This tree diagram I'm particularly fond of, it, it illustrates each element of the Jupiter Hammond Project, as well as the central role of community outreach. We had promotional material before each event. We had social media posts planned for in advance. Um, we had panelist videos that were released as teasers on Instagram and Facebook. But you can see here that each round table has three parts. The round table itself, as well as a breakout meeting, which occurred directly after the round table. And then about one week later, we had office hours with the expert panelists who attended that round table. And people just had one more opportunity to uh, explore any specific topics more in depth. This here are a few screenshots from each component of the project. So you can see at the top left, we have a Facebook post from roundtable number one. We have a getting to know video. We put together quick getting to know videos of each of these experts before the roundtable so that you could have a bit more of an understanding as to what subjects that they foc would focus on. Instagram posts. We have a interview with our moderator Cordell Reeves as well as a study hall where we looked at some of the resources. And in this one, we are looking at uh, People Not Property with Jessica Crick. To publicly kick off the Jupiter Hammond Project, we worked with partner institutions to hope three virtual public roundtables that took place in the summer and fall of last year. Each one delving into different topics connected to Jupiter Hammond's story and enslavement on Long Island. They were Long Island and the Black Atlantic, the first roundtable, and we partnered with Weeksville Heritage Center. The second roundtable was the voice of Jupiter Hammond, and we partnered with Suffolk County Historical Society. And it was also here during the second roundtable when a participant asked Malik to read one of Jupiter Hammond's poems. It was impromptu, but we are certainly grateful that they did. And the last roundtable was Confronting Slavery at Joseph Lloyd Manor, and we partnered with the Lloyd Harbor Historical Society. This here, it, at each of the roundtables, we featured a fantastic panel of scholars and professionals, all of which you can see right here. And each roundtable was moderated by the wonderful Cordell Reeves. He's at the top center. With the first phase of the Jupiter Hammond project, we gathered important information about what kind of content the public wants to learn more about and how we could engage them at the Joseph Lloyd Manor. Some of the emerging themes that we found that people really wanted to explore, explore are the integral role of enslaved people on Long Island, Native African and African American social and cultural dynamics, religious practices and beliefs, 
freedom, emancipation, and abolition, literacy and the 18th century public sphere, and roots of inequality and systemic racism today. We also found that there was a lot of interest in interpretation through contemporary arts, revising the K-12 curriculum, which currently does a poor job at conveying this history. We received a tremendous amount of feedback from people saying, I didn't learn that in school and more visual and collaborative programs just like this one today. The Joseph Lloyd Manor tour was last interpreted in the 1980s and 90s, and if you were to visit today, although the house is temporarily closed to the public, you'd encounter a series of period rooms furnished according to the 17, 1793 estate inventory of Joseph's nephew, John Lloyd II. And despite the documentation of 10 enslaved people in that inventory, these spaces, like the parlor you see here, emphasize an elite white culture perspective and ignores the presence of the men and women and children, the Lloyds enslaved. The stories of John, Judith Potter, Hannah, Jupiter Hannon, Boston, Benjamin, Samuel, Edward, and Sarah are more or less marginalized through the installation of an enslaved quarter in the back corner of the house. Overshadowed by a great spinning wheel, the space does not convey the entirety of their lived experiences as people and oversimplifies a multi-generational story of survival and resistance. And although we do tend to focus on Jupiter Hammond, we understand that his voice cannot speak for all the people the Lloyds enslaved over four generations. People who also asserted their own identities and humanity. We're currently working on what we call phase 1B of the Jupiter Hammond project, we want to reopen the house and begin to incorporate some of these lessons learned from the roundtables, particularly introducing the names of over 42 men and women who were enslaved by the Lloyd family. We're collaborating with Malik Work to create an audio video component of Jupiter's poems, which we're all very eager to see. Mm -hmm. We also want to offer more opportunities for feedback to hear the voices of our community. With that, we would like to say thank you. There is still so much to come, but I hope we are off to a good start. If anybody has any questions or would like to learn more, we would love to hear from you. Please feel free to add any comments that you have into the chat at this time. Lauren and Darren, thank you so much that I've been following the Jupiter Hammond Project and I still, I learn something new every time I hear you present. Me that too. There's a lot to learn and explore. So I will kick us off with a question while we're waiting. Sure, so sure. what is next for the Jupiter Hammond Project? You mentioned your sort of phase B of reinterpreting the, the house. Are there any other plans or is that sort of the next? The next that's, the, that's the next phase. That's what where our time and efforts are going to right now. We want to bring the story of the Jupiter Hammond Project into the house, mm -hmm. which also starts to resonate the stories of all of those who were enslaved by the Lloyds into the yeah. house. And we, you know, we launched this project during the pandemic. Um, we, you know, planned this project, you know, a hundred years ago, it feels like, um, <laughs> when, um, you know, the world was still open. And so we wanted to do a lot more community outreach and meet people. And we just weren't able to do that for obvious reasons. So that's something that we hope to do more um, you know, in the future as we continue this project and bring people to the house and have workshops and have conversations. And so that's what um, we hope to continue to do as well. Yeah, Lauren, you're talking about 2019 when we started. It's hard to remember 2019. <laughs> it seems like an impossible world, like, oh my goodness, we were walking around amongst one another. <laughs> what were we thinking? <laughs> um, yeah, it looks like we have like plenty yesterday. of questions now. And here, Lauren, we have a, a nice one from Artroy. And how is it that slaves can learn to read and write, let alone get published? Um, so Hammond was educated um, by the people who enslaved him. So Mary Lloyd, I think, you know, had a big influence on in this. She, you know, strongly believed, um, you know, from the biography of her that's included in the publication of her religious writings that she, you know, devoted, you know, Sabbath to teaching people um, about the Bible and religion. And there was um, a schoolhouse on Lloyd Neck. Um, Hammond was 12, about 12 years old when it was constructed. So there's also thought that he was educated there by a graduate, Nehemiah Bull of Yale University. Um, and also too, um, and this is going a little bit into the weeds, but um, the Lloyds were heavily involved in the Episcopal Church and the Episcopal Church um, had 
this initiative called the Society for the, I'm going to get this wrong, um, the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts. And one of the main um, missions of that was to um, educate enslaved people in, in, you know, in the Bible and religion. And education is not uncommon. It's not. We keep reading reports about the men and women who were enslaved and still educated. I think we are just more familiar with the stories of enslavement in the South. And that's, right. go ahead, yeah, Lord, were, yeah, that's when were, you hear that. There were no laws in New York during the colonial period mm -hmm. that um, made it illegal to teach an enslaved person to read and write. No. Like there were, you know, in the South in the 19th century. Mona asked, did Jupiter Hammond have any children? No. No. <laughs> Unfortunately. No, yeah. um, and do we know what ship his grandparents were brought to in the U.S.? I know. No. Yeah, right? Wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah. Donna Marie, I know she, she's here from Sylvester Manor. I don't believe um, we have the answer to that, but I, I defer her, to her if she's, she's got an answer. Yeah, we'd love to know. Um, does Jupiter Hammond have descendants? Yes, um, and this is part of what we want to continue to do is to connect with descendants. You know, Hammond never married, never had children, um, but we do know that there were descendants, um, people who can trace their line lineage to um, his brother Obadiah um, and his children and grandchildren. This is, this is great, Lauren. Marilyn wants to know, who was the young man you mentioned earlier who took his freedom along with the violin and sheet music? Michael Cox. Um, and so he's somebody that I uh, recently discovered um, in, you know, the ongoing research that we're always doing. And it's, it's a, you know, what people often refer to as a runaway slave ad um, is something that I found. The date is 1790 and Michael Cox is really, really interesting. Um, so it goes into a, um, you know, a description of his physical appearance, um, also says that, you know, he takes with him his violin, his sheet music, but that he also knew how to read and write and that he was intelligent. Um, so, you know, Hammond is not an anomaly among the people enslaved. Uh, at Joseph Lloyd Manor. And then it also goes um, deeply into, you know, the kind of clothing he was wearing and what he um, took with him. Lauren, this next question, I wish we had Malik with us because he certainly has opinions here. Virginia asks, or mentions, I wonder if Jupiter Hammond's poetry was ever delivered in song, as I understand it was written in a similar manner to hymns. Can the traditions of storytelling through song be in his work as well? And I think absolutely. I think so. Yeah, yeah. I think that is um, a valid uh, conclusion to make. You know, we'll never know for sure, but I, I think that's highly possible. Yeah, it's something Malik work. The gentleman yeah. we watched recite Jupiter's poem earlier, he talks a lot about the rhythm, the cadence of Jupiter's poem and how it resonates with hymns as well as one's heartbeat, the yeah. kind of and pulse songs, that it... And you think about too, like the book he inherits from his father is a book of Psalms. So yeah. there is this, uh, you know, musicality to, to all of us. Uh, let's see here. Marilyn uh, asks again, was Jupiter Hammond resigned to being enslaved or did he believe this was the destiny of Americans in, in Amer of Africans in America and so they should not seek to be free? I'm trying to understand his philosophy. Yeah, we, you know, there's, it's a really, that's a good question yeah. and it's a really complicated answer. Um, you know, through his essay on sa slavery, you know, he, you know, overtly denounces, you know, enslavement. Um, but, you know, and this is something that uh, Professor uh, Cedric May, who's, you know, written a lot about um, Jupiter Hammond, is that, like, Hammond really, you know, struggled with the fact that, you know, he was enslaved and believed it was a sin, um, but at the same time is deeply religious, and so how could God, you know, permit enslavement to exist? And so then he comes to this conclusion that actually slavery was made by man. Um, so it's, it's really complicated. And so you read an address to the Negroes in the state of New York, and he, and he outright says, you know, freedom is not for him, but you've got to look at that within the context of his situation as a 75 year old elder, um, who would not have been able to support himself if he were, you know, freed. Um, so it's complicated. Very, very complicated. And he didn't have that many options available to him. 
Um, no, thankfully, even... he had, you know, he was, despite his reservations about freedom, his, his, his own freedom, um, you know, we believe that he was freed um, by Amelia Lloyd, so the widow of John Lloyd II, who was the third member of the Lloyd family, third generation of the Lloyd family to enslave him, and had, you know, the, the grandchildren of his brother Obadiah, um, Benjamin and Phoebe, and so lived with them in that house that's on West Shore Road, uh, we believe, um, and was actually able, so there was an orchard that was planted for Hammond before the Revolutionary War on Lloyd Neck, and actually um, had a little bit of an income from it, so ended up actually supporting that small family through the income that he received from the orchard, until his death, obviously, and then, you know, Benjamin does not inherit the orchard, um, and ultimately ends up having to sell the house and, um, you know, present himself to the overseers of the poor of the town of Huntington. But I think that's the that's the important moment right there. That's what Jupiter Hammond was concerned about. You know, yeah. he was in yeah. a fortunate position to have the orchard, but understood it wouldn't be enough. His family couldn't survive without that. Uh, and, and so many other enslaved men and women or freed men and women at that point would have would have fallen upon the same fate. Cheryl, are you reaching out to Long Island school districts and or New York State Department of Education to include the history of slavery? It's incredible how New York has hidden, hidden its slavery past. It's, it's absolutely true. Yes, we want to make this a school program. I, do, I feel like New York doesn't try to hide the um, history of slavery. They just try to make it a Southern problem. They try to push, and I, I, that's just, uh, <laughs> that's the history that's presented. It was a problem in the South. But no, we had just as many just as many people enslaved here. However, it would be fewer people enslaved at more households. So we don't have a plantation with 200 people enslaved at that site like you do in the South. But here we will have 200 homes and they each have one to three people uh, people there. And to put this in the context of Long Island, more people were enslaved on Long Island than anywhere else in the North during the colonial period. Um, which is incredible to think about. Yeah. Is there any information about Hammond's activity on behalf of the Lloyd's family and their business? Did he travel independently in this regard? And before we answer, I just want to say, this is a wonderful audience yeah. you have, Tracy. This is fantastic. <laughs> Lots of really good questions. Really I love it. And I'm not skipping any questions. This is straight down the line. <laughs> this is great. Yeah, so there are um, um, instances of, you know, Hammond doing some kind of business related work. Um, Darren actually discovered a couple of years ago a letter that's um, in the archives of Shelter Island Historical Society um, where uh, Hammond is being sent to the Deerings um, who are connected to the history of our custom house um, and is delivering seeds. Um, and this is happening in Connecticut while they're both in exile in Connecticut during the Revolutionary War. So he, he is, you know, in, involved in some way in, um, in helping the Lloyd's, you know, business. And something about that that personally interests me is the travel aspect, because it seems like Jupiter would have been traveling by boat or ship to traverse Long Island, which uh, seems like such a foreign concept to me these days that, he, you know, you're not just hopping on the LIE, but how he would, how you would get around the island. Donna Marie wrote back, she says she doesn't, she unfortunately does not know the name of the ship, but Nathaniel Sylvester um, had his own ship, but we don't know if the enslaved people traveled on it. Good, thanks. Hopefully that's something we can uncover later. Um, let's see here. Oh, people just saying thank you, wanting to enjoy the, pro enjoy the project, learning more, um, wonderful. Have you approached the Find Your Roots TV program, which has traced people to African <laughs> tribes and slave ships? <laughs> we have not, no. but that would be amazing. <laughs> yeah, yep, that's, uh, it's, it's, it's worth looking into. Um, could you please speak more about the publication process of Jupiter Hammond? Huh. You mentioned that the Lloyd, the, the Lloyd would have uh, been involved in this process. Could you please speak a little bit more about this and about who published this work and what kind of distribution it might have had? Thanks from Tammy. Yeah. Good question. Um, this came up at the roundtables as well. Yeah, it did. We don't really know about like how the Lloyds were involved in the publication of his works. Um, 
Gosh, um, you know, there were publishers, so it was a Boston, not Boston, a New York publisher who published um, originally uh, an address to the Negroes in the state of New York. And then it gets re republished and reprinted in, um, in 1806. And it's actually uh, published by uh, Quaker abolitionists in uh, Philadelphia area. And so there's a lot of, you know, interesting um, histories. I haven't gone so much into diving into the exact publishers of his work, um, but it, it's a really good question. I think there's a lot of mystery around it and a lot still to learn. Yeah. Of the, uh, Stanley asks, of the five orchards, have any, has any one of them been identified as Jupiter's orchard? No, no. I, I, I wish we could know. I don't, I don't even know how we would come across that information, but it would be wonderful to find out. Um, great, glad that we're mentioning it as a Southern problem. <laughs> we're dropping a lot of useful information and perspectives. I'm glad. <laughs> uh, Alicia, were free people able to attend school or learn a trade to become independent? And this is going into, and this is an area that I haven't spent so much time thinking about and studying. So I, I hesitate to try to answer in full because I just don't have all the information at my fingertips. But there were, you know, a lot of Quakers on Long Island involved in um, the development of schools. There was the African Free School in New York City during the early 19th century. So there, there is, a, there is um, a, a definitely a history of that. I just, I don't have enough information um, you know, in my brain right now to tell you <laughs> more. We have one more from Carolyn. Is there any inf info about the Native Americans in this area and their interaction with the mansion and the community? Thanks. This has been wonderful. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I hope, I hope there is. Um, so there, I showed in um, one of the first slides, the archaeological material that was excavated mm -hmm. from around Joseph Floyd Manor in the 1980s. We, um, those, um, those studies uncovered a, a, what we think is like a, a pit that indigenous Matinecock people used to steam shellfish. Um, I think there's still more to learn. So we haven't been able to look closely at Henry Lloyd's uh, ledgers. And I think that's where um, Jupiter's uh, birth is recorded where on that same page you see one old Narragansett man. So I think there's more that we could learn from that, um, those historical records, um, which we just haven't been able to look at yet. Um, so hopefully we can learn more about those connections between enslaved people and the Matinecock, um, who were still present. You know, we have a map in our collection that's dated to 1817 and you can still see and it's a it's a manuscript map of the neck and there's still you know there's a little dwelling and there it's hard to see but it says you know indian house above it so you know into the 19th century there are matinecock peoples who are living on lloyd neck um and documented uh mona she mentions here that there were two african free school two african free schools one for girls and one for boys many blacks learned a trade took side work and purchased themselves and their families Great. thank you mona yeah uh and there we go virginia says thank you <laughs> darren and lauren if anyone is interested in in following along with the project or or wants more information on preservation long island how do they do that? Is there a mailing list? Is there? Yes, the we way? have. Oh, here we do have one more. Mary, are the heart, are the Henry Lloyd's ledgers in our collection? They are not. They are at the newly called Center for the Brooklyn Historical Society, which is now the Center for the History of Center for I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They've merged with the Brooklyn Public Library. Uh, so I think it's the Center for the Study of Brooklyn History now. Um, and there's, there is a merging that's happening. And because of the pandemic, um, we haven't been able to look at them yet. But that's where they are. And Brooklyn Historical Society was formerly the Long Island Historical Society. So that's why they're there. Yep. The other Lloyd papers, just as an aside, are at the New York Historical Society. If you want to learn more, we do have more things going on. We have a historian stories coming up later this month. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, next month. We're not into May yet. On the 21st at 10 a.m., we have Chris Ryan, who is the village historian for the Incorporated Village of Port Jefferson. He's going to be having a little, a little talk with us if you want to join. 
We also have membership. If you're interested in becoming a member, there are numerous benefits, including free admission, subscription to our newsletter, like Tracy was just asking about, discounted admission to public programs, access to advisory services, invitations to special membership events, membership cards, lots of fun stuff. Here's the link, come become a member. You can also follow us on Facebook or Instagram, Preservation Long Island. And if you have any further questions for Lauren or myself, here's our information right there. And if you are interested in watching the roundtables, which were truly incredible, um, all of that is on our website for you to explore and really dig into all of, you know, a lot of the sources that I talked about um, are all on our website. So you yep. can look at them. And I'll send that out in the email after with the recording, I'll send their website so that you can go on there for more information. And I have a question of our participants because we had a lot of new participants and a lot that registered in the middle of the night and kind of all in one block. So I'm wondering where you heard about today's event. I'm suspecting maybe there was a Facebook post or something that, that drew a bunch of people in all at once. So if you're willing to share that with us in the chat, I would love to know how you heard about the event um, and maybe what prompted you to join. Absolutely. Uh, Long Island University, email. THT. I saw an email this morning. <laughs> Great. Great. Email last night. Did you send an email out last night, Tracy? I sent an email uh, Wednesday morning, so so probably people kind of read it throughout the day. LIU student. Nice. Ooh, university students stay up late. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tiffany <laughs> registered at three in the morning, so I was so curious. Yeah. Preservation Long Island email, terrific. Okay. Oh, we sent an email too. Yeah, but we sent it. We didn't send it late, we, not we 3 a.m. Yeah. But not, yeah, super late. Yeah. Through a friend, a librarian, DC, grew up in Long Island. Remember? Okay. We noticed last night. <laughs> email. I mean, that's overwhelmingly the majority. <laughs> it's coming from an email. This okay. is good to know. Yeah. But I think yeah, university cool. students, we should see how many emails come from uh, .edu. And, uh, too many. I saw a few. Oh, all right. You yeah. Then we just have a bunch go. of night owls who are interested in Jupiter Hammond. I'm yeah. happy to see it. <laughs> I'm so happy. Thank you, everyone, for sharing on your list from the roundtables. Okay, terrific. Well, thank you so much, everyone. And thank you again, Lauren and Darren. And like I said, I'll send all this information in an email with the recording to everyone who signed up. And hopefully we'll see you again soon. All right. Thank, thank you. you, Tracy. Thank you, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Hi, everybody. Hi.